Well, welcome and good evening. I'm Jen Farmer. I'm the CEO at the Friedrichs Taxia Research Alliance, and I'm joined by my colleague, Lane Rodden, who's the Director of Patient Engagement. And we are, um, on behalf of Farah, we are really glad to host this webinar for you. Um, we appreciate that many of you who registered submitted questions in advance. And some of those questions will be addressed during the presentation. And some um, we will open with um, after the presentation during the Q&A session. If you didn't get a chance to submit questions in advance or you have a new question during the webinar, um, there is a Q&A box. It's either at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. And you can just tap that Q&A box, type your question in and we'll get it. And at, again, at the end of the presentation, um, we'll work through the questions that are submitted. And so with that, we're gonna start with the presentation. And I am thrilled to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Carol ben Maimon, who is the president and the CEO of Laramar Therapeutics. Laramar is developing CTI-1601 as a potential for taxin replacement therapy for patients with Friedrich's ataxia. Dr. Ben Maiman will be providing updates on the development of CTI-1601. Dr. Ben Maiman. Thanks, Jen. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're really thrilled to be here and we're thrilled to be able to give you an update on the status of uh, CTI-1601. Um, on behalf of Laramar, before I start, I'd like to thank Farah, who has been a supportive collaborator over the years. I also want to really thank the FA community and specifically the people living with FA who have participated in our previous clinical studies. Um, Lane, slide two. During the web, this webinar, I will be providing a brief overview of CTI 1601 and the completed phase one studies. I will then provide a development update and then spend some time describing our next planned clinical study a phase two study to determine the preferred dose for CTI 1601. At the conclusion of the presentation, I will be happy to take some questions. Slide three. For those of you who do not know the story of CTI 1601, let me briefly describe what it is and how it was developed. Slide four. As you all know, the cause of Friedrich's ataxia is a very low level of frataxin inside cells. Frataxin is a protein that is important in maintaining healthy cellular function. Providing additional frataxin to people who do not have enough frataxin has been the challenge in potentially finding a treatment for patients with Friedrich's ataxia. Dr. Mark Payne at the University of Indiana School of Medicine who co-founded Chondrial Therapeutics, now operating under the name of Laramar Therapeutics, developed CTI 1601 to do just that, increase for taxin levels in patients with Friedrich's ataxia. Dr. Payne figured out that attaching a small protein fragment called a cell penetrating peptide to a protein sequence that is identical to the normal frataxin molecule might allow the frataxin protein to get into the cell and do its job. On the left panel of the slide, you can see normal frataxin. On the right panel, you can see CTI 1601. It is identical to normal frataxin except for the purple segment, which is the cell penetrating peptide that is intended to carry frataxin into the cell. Slide five, Lane. I am not going to go into a lot of detail on this slide, but you can see from the schematic, CTI 1601 is intended to deliver the same frataxin molecule to the cell. Dr. Payne tested CTI 1601 in a mouse model of Friedrich's ataxia and showed that treatment with CTI 1601 decrease the development of ataxia and heart disease in the treated mice. Slide six. So now let's focus on the clinical trials that have been completed so far. Slide seven. We performed two phase one studies, a single ascending dose study and a multiple ascending dose study. This means that as the study progressed, 
we gave higher and more frequent doses of CTI-1601 to each dose group of participants in the studies. Both studies were performed at Clinilabs Labs in, Eaton, in Eatontown, New Jersey. CTI-1601 is administered by giving an injection just under the skin. In the single ascending dose study, 28 patients with Friedrich's ataxia were enrolled and were distributed across four dose groups that received a single dose of CTI-1601 at 25, 50, 75, or 100 milligrams. After each dose group was completed, a committee with doctors and a patient advocate who are not part of the company reviewed the safety data before the next dose group was dosed. This was also done in the multiple ascending dose study, which enrolled 27 patients with Friedrich's ataxia over three dose groups. The dosing scheme for these dose groups was a bit complex, so I'll walk through that in a moment. After that, I'll summarize the results of the studies. Slide eight. In the multiple ascending dose group study, there were three dose groups, a 25, a 50, and 100 milligram dose group. The 25 milligram dose group received daily injections for four days, and then injections every three days through day 13. The 50 milligram dose group, which you see in the middle, received daily injections for seven days, and then injections every two days through day 13. And the 100 milligram dose group on the far right received daily injections for 13 days. In addition, some participants in each dose group received placebo with no CTI-1601. We measured for taxin levels in cheek cells and skin cells at baseline and on day 13 in all dose groups. We also measured for taxin in cheek cells on day four for the 25 milligram dose group and day seven for the 50 and 100 milligram dose groups. It's important to understand that the frequency of dosing in the lower dose groups was intermittent and the 25 milligram dose group only dosed daily for four days. Slide nine. Here is some information on the 27 participants in the multiple ascending dose study. For this study, participants needed to be 18 years of age or older and have an MFAR score of at least 20. The average age of, participa of participants was just under 32, with the youngest participating being 19 and the oldest participant being 65. The average age at diagnosis was almost 23, with five being the age of the earliest diagnosis and 64 being the age of the latest diagnosis. Over half of the participants used a wheelchair to get around and just over 20% did not use any assistive mo mobility devices. Our study design allowed for participants in the single ascending dose study to also participate in the multiple ascending dose study, and 16 patients with FA participated in both studies. Slide 10. There were no serious adverse events recorded in either study. The most common adverse events were a reaction at the place where the injection was given, and most of those were mild and resolved within an hour. Remember that in the multiple ascending dose study, as dose increased, we also increased the number of injections. And of course, the more injections a participant got, the more injection site reactions were recorded. But other than injection site reactions, such as redness and irritation, the number and severity of adverse events were not higher in the higher dose groups. We did have one participant in the 50 milligram dose group of the MAD study who had headache, nausea, and vomiting and decided to withdraw from the study after the first dose, but all other participants completed the study. Slide 11. Peak blood levels of CTI 1601 occurred pretty quickly after the injection was given. As expected, as the dose of CTI-1601 was increased, the blood levels of CTI-1601 increased as well. Slide 12. 
We were very excited to see that after seven days of daily dosing, cheek cells cheek cell levels of frataxin increased to levels that would be close to levels of frataxin that we estimate would be found in carriers of Friedrich's ataxia. People who have one gene that has the GAA repeat expansion and one gene that does not. This is shown by the green dashed line. Keep in mind that the 25 milligram dose group only received four days of daily dosing. And in our upcoming clinical study, we will be looking to see what the frataxin levels will be after daily administration of CTI 1601 for 14 days, followed by every other day dosing for another 14 days. The graph you see here shows the data from cells obtained by swabbing the inside of the cheek. We also saw increases in frataxin levels in skin cells obtained by skin punch biopsy. Protaxin levels are an early indicator that the drug is delivering protaxin to tissues. Protaxin levels also can be helpful in the selection of the dose to be used in long-term studies where clinical benefit will be assessed. Slide 13. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what has happened since we finished the multiple ascending dose study. Slide 14. Towards the end of the multiple ascending dose clinical study, we started a six month toxicology study in non-human primates or small monkeys. This study was started in order to support longer term dosing as planned for the open label extension study for those who had participated in the SAD and MAD clinical trials. After the MAD study ended, three of the 34 monkeys in the toxicology study died. There were four dose groups and a placebo dose group in this monkey study. These three monkeys were in the higher dose groups and were noted to have very high blood levels of CTI 1601 compared to the other monkeys in the study. Of course, we notified the FDA about the deaths and the FDA decided to put us on clinical hold which means that we could not do any clinical studies until the toxicology study completed and FDA could review the results. In January of 2022, we submitted the results of the toxicology study and our conclusion to the FDA. Once FDA had a chance to review the information submitted, they came back to us and asked us to provide some additional information. At that point, we thought it would be best to meet with the FDA to make sure we understood what they wanted to see. So we, so we met with the FDA and had a very, very constructive discussion. We submitted the additional analyses they requested along with the design of the proposed next clinical study. And the FDA came back and said that we could enroll the first dose group of subjects in the proposed study and then submit data from that first part of the study for their review and to give clearance if we decide to add a higher dose to the study. Even though it took just a minute to say that, this process was very thorough and it took over a year from the time the toxicology study completed to receive the final FDA allowance to go back into the clinic. Slide 15. Before I proceed to a discussion of the upcoming clinical study, let me provide you with some information on the conclusions from the monkey studies we have conducted to date. There have been a total of three toxicology studies conducted in monkeys. You can see the length of dosing in each of these studies on the slide. There were no animal deaths in any study except the 26-week study. As I said earlier, there were three deaths in the study and all three were in the two highest dose groups. These monkeys had very high levels of CTI 1601 in their blood compared to the other monkeys. You can also see from the slide that when you compare the average blood levels of CTI 1601 from monkeys at the dose where there were no adverse events at all to the blood levels from participants in the multiple ascending dose study, there is generally a tenfold difference. The average blood levels from monkeys with no adverse events is generally 10 times higher 
than the average for patients who participated in the 25 milligram and 50 milligram dose groups of the MAD study. The next study is designed to provide additional information on blood, blood levels in patients in order to help us better understand how blood levels of CTI 1601 change over time. This information is important so that a safe dose and dose regimen can be selected for long-term studies. Slide 16. In the last part of this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the upcoming study. Slide 17. Study 200 is a phase two dose exploration study in patients with FA. Under our agreement with the FDA, we will evaluate a 25 milligram dose of CTI 1601 given daily for 14 days, followed by doses given every other day for 14 days. We will be assessing safety, blood levels of CTI 1601, and levels of frataxin in cheek cells and skin cells throughout the study. The study initial, will initially enroll 12 to 15 patients with FA who will be randomized two to one to receive either CTI 1601, eight to 10 participants, or placebo, four to five participants. Once dosing is completed, the data will be reviewed by both an independent data monitoring committee, and we will also send the data to FDA to give clearance if we decide to add any higher doses to the study. Ambulatory and non-ambulatory patients who are 18 years of age or older will be eligible for the study. Also, patients who participated in the SAD and MAD studies as well as patients who have not participated in any CTI 1601 study are also eligible to screen. The top bar in green shows the 28 day treatment period and the administration schedule. Slide 18. We are going back to Clinilabs Labs to do this study. Dr. Shenouda was the principal investigator of the two previous studies and he and his staff have experience with patients with FA and administration of CTI 1601. Participants as well as caregivers, if appropriate, will stay at ClinLab starting a few days before dosing through the last day of daily dosing. Participants will then stay in nearby hotels over the next 10 days and transportation to ClinLabs for the injections and then back to the hotel every other day will be provided. For the last few days of the treatment period, the participants again will stay at ClinLabs Labs before being just discharged on day 29. There will be outpatient follow-ups at approximately days 35 and 58. Although we understand that this is inconvenient, this is necessary to ensure that we observe participants after dosing and collect all the important data we will need to further evaluate safety, blood levels of CTI 1601, and for taxin levels in tissue to help inform what doses should be used in future clinical studies. Slide 19. Before I summarize, we have implemented several precautions to try to ensure that we do everything we can to keep participants safe and still collect the data needed. As I said earlier, patients will stay in the ClinLabs unit for the first 14 days of dosing. All doses will be given at the site by a trained healthcare professional, and participants will be observed for at least four hours after doses are given. In addition, blood, blood work to assess safety will be performed periodically and reviewed throughout the study. All adverse events will be recorded and assessed as they occur. And finally, all injection sites will be watched and monitored before and after each dose. Slide 20. So in summary, FDA has given us clearance to begin a study evaluating the 25 milligram dose of CTI 1601 for a longer period of time, specifically over 28 days. Information about participating in any of our clinical trials will be communicated by FARA and our clinical site. 
Again, I would like to thank Farah for their continued help and, and again, thank all the patients who participated in our previous studies. Also, I would like to thank all of you who participated in this webinar. We understand the unmet medical need in the FA community, and we look forward to working with you on our upcoming CTI 1601 trial. Slide 21. Thank you so much for listening to this webinar. I'm now happy to take a few questions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ben Maiman. Now we'll start the question and answer session. Um, we're going to start with a question that we get, uh, that we receive from a lot of people that's really important to our community. Can patients from outside the U.S. or children participate in this trial? And if not, are there plans for a trial outside of the U.S. or a trial for children in the future? So at this point, no, the answer is no. Um, people from outside the U.S. cannot participate in this trial. It's limited to U.S. citizens. Um, and that's because we absolutely plan to give patients access to um, the open label extension, which right now will only have clinical sites in the United States. We are um, in discussions with the European authorities. We have been awarded what's called prime designation, which is an accelerated review program, not review, but accelerated development program. So we are in communication with European authorities and we are making plans to do work in Europe and make the, make the um, clinical trials available to patients outside of the US. Um, with regard to children, um, people under 18 years of age, Right now, we are not permitted by FDA regulation. Um, in order to dose children, you need to have the potential for a direct benefit, and that does not constitute a 28-day study. So we need to be able to have the open label extension available when we start to dose children so that we can then roll them into open label extension where they would have the potential for a direct clinical benefit. And that right now, again, very, um, very cautiously I give guidance, is planned to start the second half of this year, but all of that will depend on um, FDA review and, and um, you know, clearance for us to continue to move forward. We've had a few questions about uh, the drug itself. The first one is, does the TAT for taxa molecule cross the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, yes, that a lot. Um, so TAT is the cell penetrating peptide, that purple segment of the molecule that was on the schematic. Um, it is a very small sequence of amino acids. It has been shown to, when attached to other cargo, so not when attached to frataxin, but when attached to other cargo, it has been shown to carry those molecules across the blood-brain barrier. So we anticipate that it does cross the blood-brain barrier um, also, Dr. Payne did a study in the neuromouse model knockout, which were mice that do not have frataxin in their brain, spinal cord, and dorsal root ganglion, all cent central nervous system um, tissues. And he was able to show that if he started dosing the drug at day seven, so before they developed ataxia, he was able to prevent the development of the ataxia and prolong the life of those mice. He then took out the brains and spinal cord and dorsal root ganglion of those mice, and he was able to measure human frataxin in those tissues. So although not conclusive data, um, we do have some data to suggest that it does cross the blood-brain barrier. The next question is, my understanding is that the phase one trial was only for buccal cells. Is it anticipated that the treatment will target specific organs or could it be extended to the full body? So the drug is given systemically. Um, it's given as a, an injection under the skin. So it's not targeting the, buck, the, the cheek cells. It, that's where we're measuring it. And we're measuring it there because it's an easily accessible tissue. It's very hard to biopsy your heart or to biopsy your spinal cord, but it's very easy to, to take tissues from the inside of your cheek. And so that's how we monitor it. But we fully anticipate that the drug is getting to all of the organs in the body. Um, and we have evidence of that because as I said earlier, we've measured it in brain, spinal cord, dorsal root ganglion, not the drug, we've measured for taxin, actually human for taxin. We've measured heart, we've measured um, 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 liver, 
We've measured skin, obviously, and um, and buccal cells and platelets. So we believe that it is distributing throughout the body. We have a few questions about the injection site reactions. People are asking, why does the drug cause injection site reactions? Was there a difference between people on the drug and those on placebo? And did you see any allergic reactions? Okay. Um, let me speak first to the animals injection site reactions because they are very different than what we're seeing in people. Um, the monkeys, you have to understand, are about four pounds. They're very, very small animals. They're smaller than a, than a, a human newborn. And the, we are injecting across eight different sites right along their spinal cord. And we're giving very high doses. So these are very high volumes of drugs. So it's a lot of fluid that's getting injected into each injection site daily. Um, and so we do see significant injection site reactions as you go to higher doses. So with the lower doses, they're not quite so bad, but as you go to the higher doses, we start to see the injection sites really get inflamed and the tissues start to break down. That's not at all what we saw in people. And remember, we went up to 100 milligrams, which was two cc's of volume, which is quite a big amount of volume. Um, and we mostly in people, as I said, we saw redness, itching, um, some um, swelling, not uncommon at all with a, um, a subcutaneous injection and under the skin injection. 43% of the patients who had were getting placebo had, had reactions. Most of them resolved within an hour. They were all mild to moderate um, and nobody dropped out of the study because of an injection site reaction or because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't tolerate the injections. And we're giving over eight sites in this study. So two, four abdominal sites and four, four thigh sites, two on each thigh. Um, so a lot more space in a person than we have in these, in these monkeys. Um, with regard to an allergic reactions, we have not seen any allergic reactions. What we're seeing at these injection sites are not out allergic reactions. Um, they are reactions to the drug at, under the, being administered repetitively under the skin in these very small areas. Um, but we did not see any allergic reactions in, in patients. Um, now we only dosed a few patients. We have to be very cautious. Um, you know, it was 28 in one study and 27 in the other, and some of them were the same patients. Um, so it's a very small sample number, but to date we have not seen any allergic reactions. The next few questions are about the non-human primate study. People are wondering why were there such high levels in the three monkeys that you mentioned? Was there immediate, an immediate cause of death named in the necropsy reports? So we have not identified the, the, the cause of death. We have identified though that it is associated with high levels of drug. And we believe that the reason those animals had the high doses of drug is there the animals that died, the, inje the injection sites on necropsy. So on when, we, when animals were sacrificed and their tissues were looked at under a microscope, we see a lot of breakdown of the vasculature, a lot of inflammation at those sites. And so these animals, we think that the, the accumulation may have been a function of the fact that the injection sites were breaking down and the vasculature in, at the injection sites was breaking down. And so there was really increased absorption at those sites um, that was not seen in the animals with less severe injection sites. Did any of the other non-human primates experience similar but non-fatal health issues? There were several animals, and um, we have said this publicly, I have to be careful with what I say, that I make sure that I'm only giving information that's in the public domain. But we have said that there were some animals that were reported to have what was described by the site as limb rigidity. We could not, we were unable, we did go try and look and we were unable to observe it. Um, it was sporadic. Um, it occurred very quickly after, after dose and then resolved on its own and the animals went on to finished their study and you know, go all the way to the end and completed the, the dosing period. They didn't miss any doses. Um, but that's one of the reasons for observing patients for a period of four hours after dosing, just to make sure everything is okay. 
Okay, we've got a few questions about the dose selection for the upcoming study. This person's asking, daily dosing at 100 milligrams did not result in drug accumulation, but barely reached carrier levels. What is the rationale for choosing the lower dose for the new study? And are you considering patient's weight? Um, so the, we saw with 50 milligrams and 100 milligrams at day seven, um, it, uh, levels in the buccal cells approximating those of carriers. Um, they, they did go down after um, we switched to every other day dosing with the 50, with the 50 milligram. But we still think that the half-life of frataxin, so the, the le length of time that frataxin lives inside the mitochondria may actually be longer than the length of time that the drug lives in the blood. And if that's the case, we should be able to go, if we go for longer daily dosing and then decrease the dose, we may very well be able to maintain for taxin levels. And I wanna just reiterate, more is not necessarily better. Um, for taxin, we know in animals, at least in, in mice, can be very toxic at, high, at very high levels. And so since there is no need to go to 100%, we're not targeting 100%. We're targeting somewhere between 50, 60, and 70%. There are also some key opinion leaders out there, specifically um, Dr. Lynch, and I don't want to speak for him, but who seems to, be, to be, believe that even minimal increases in frataxin can be clinically relevant. And so we believe that we, the most important thing to do is to identify the lowest minimum effect dose and then test that. And if we need to go higher, then we go higher. But um, we don't want to get to too high levels of frataxin because we don't know what high levels of frataxin may lead to. Thank you. A few more questions um, about dose selection. Can you change the dose in the middle of the study if it doesn't result in reaching carrier levels? So we, fit, we will finish the 25 milligram dose look at all of the data. We will submit that data to the FDA and to the um, data monitoring committee. And if we believe it's safe and appropriate and we need to go to higher doses, we will propose a higher dose. Right now, we're talking a little bit about a 50 milligram dose, but it could be something in the middle. It could be something higher than 50, depending upon what the data shows. But um, before we actually increase the dose, we will be going to the FDA and to the data monitoring committee. Okay, the next question is, have you taken any phenotypic measurements? This is the first study that I'm aware of that has been shown to increase for taxin in living humans. And I think we're all anxious to see what the effects are. So are we. <laughs> um, we so we did look at some um, clinical outcomes. We did look at MFARs and uh, 25 foot walk and some other measures, I think nine hole peg. Um, after two weeks of dosing, especially the intermittent dosing, we really didn't expect to see anything. And honestly, we did not. Um, 28 days is also a little bit short to be expecting to, um, to see things. But I can tell you that we are looking at some exploratory outcomes. Um, we've been publicly saying that we've been looking at lipid levels. So those are the fats that are in your blood. Um, some of them very complex fats, not just things that you're used to hearing about like cholesterol and triglycerides, but some other um, fats that are, are measurable. Um, and we'll see how that show, turns out. And we've also been looking at some gene expression. So although those are not clinical outcomes, they're, they're actually measures of biochemical activity. And they do give some sense that it, not only is the frataxin going up, but maybe if we do see something, and we haven't said whether we have or not, if we do see something, it may show that, that's a, that it's actually doing something. And some of these lipids, just um, for your knowledge, have been associated with things like the um, future development of insulin dependent, not insulin dependent, um, insulin resistant diabetes, which we know is a problem in, for some patients with FA. So we are looking at some of those exploratory outcomes. And as we get more information, we'll be able to present that as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question, if frataxin is increased, 
Do you think the progression will be reversed or do you think abilities will come back? I honestly don't know. And it may depend on where you are in the course of your disease. So it may be very patient specific. Um, you know, it may be harder to reverse um, p p symptoms and, and problems that have been, have been there for a very long period of time and easier to reverse things that are more recently, you know, of concern. But I don't, I don't have the information to answer that question. Okay, we've got a few questions about FDA submission. Um, someone is asking, learning from OMAV and ensuring that we're beginning phase two with the end in mind, which would be FDA submission, how is Laramar using various and effective data points to prove efficacy that can also be compared to the natural history data if needed? It's a good question. And um, we've been thinking about this for a very long time. Um, so because our mechanism of action is so different um, than what OMAV and, and really anything else that's out there, the fact that we're raising for taxin is sort of a logical mechanism of action. Second, we are looking at these biochemical markers, which would be not evidence of necessarily a clinical effect, but evidence of activity. And then we are, as we talk about the open label extension, and we have always been planning to, um, to define a control arm that's based and defined prospectively. So we will give the criteria for how we identify those patients from the natural history database that we then will include and compare to the open label extension. I do just wanna caution people, um, there is a very significant placebo effect when patients are treated with some of these drugs. Um, so you have to take that into consideration, but we've always been planning to do a control arm against our open label extension from the natural history database. Okay. Next question, if OMAV, omavaloxalone is approved, could we be on that and participate in this trial at the same time? Not on the, not in this trial. Um, but may, I don't, I can't answer whether it will be in future trials, but not in this trial. We have another question. This person is asking, this is a significant period of time to be in a trial in a clinic away from home. What will be done and can be done to support the emotional and mental health of those that are participating? So uh, just for the record, our um, MAD study, because it was being conducted during COVID, Patients were in that unit for three and a half weeks. So not quite as long as here, but they, they didn't leave at all. Here you're in for just over two weeks and then you, can, you, you, know, you go to a hotel and then you have to come back. But it, we recognize, we absolutely recognize the inconvenience and the challenges to, to all of the people who will be participating. It's designed this way in order to make sure the data that we need will be collected, as well as to ensure that people have are being monitored and are safe, um, or as safe as we can make them. And so we recognize the inconvenience. We will do everything we possibly can to make you comfortable, um, whether it's certain types of food that people want, whether it's um, we've supplied in the last studies, we've supplied different pillows if somebody wanted a different pillow. Um, you know, whatever we possibly can do. Obviously, we can't make this home and we can't make it a luxury hotel, um, but we can do everything we can and we will do everything we can to, to do as much as we can um, to make people comfortable. Dr. Ben Maiman, thank you for that. And maybe one other thing, just when we are, one of the things I think we've talked about to try and help people manage the longer stay um, as part of the study is that if, um, so you could certainly bring caregiver with you. Um, and if your caregivers need to change because somebody can't be with you for the whole time and you need to have people kind of come and go, that would be allowable too, right? To help you manage. Absolutely. Like I said, anything that we can do that doesn't interfere with safety or the conduct of the study, we will absolutely consider. And that you know is legal and legitimate, but we will absolutely consider. 
um, you know, movie nights, whatever, you know, a whole host of different things we've, we've, we've contemplated and thought about. And I have to tell you, having done the MAD study, all three cohorts wanted different things. At one point, everybody wanted salty snacks and another in another cohort, they wanted all sweet snacks. So we tried to accommodate it. So, you know, different groups are different also. Um, and so all of that, we'll do everything we can to accommodate that as best we can. And I, I think there were things also like that um, you helped the center make sure that they had some exercise equipment yep. and things like that. Yep. Um, there are also a few more questions coming in through the chat, just going back to the cohorts. And so maybe it's worth just revisiting that, that the, the phase two right now is starting with the 25 milligram dose. And is that, you know, essentially one cohort at 25 milligram or multiple cohorts and kind of what can people, can you review again one more time what people can expect from there? Because I think there's just some. Yeah, as, as far as, again, I'm not, I'm not the medical monitor and I didn't necessarily design the study. So I'm probably, and by the way, our medical monitor, our chief medical officer was supposed to give this presentation. Unfortunately, her daughter who is significantly disabled came down with COVID and was in the intensive care unit. So I, I stepped in. Um, so sorry, you have to you have to tolerate me, and I may not be as totally up to speed. But the the right now there's one cohort planned, so one dose planned, which is the 25 milligram every day for 14 days, and then every other day, and there will be 12 to 15 patients enrolled in that cohort, um, and a, and and four to five will receive placebo the rest will receive CTI-1601. It'll be blinded, so you won't know which you're receiving. But they, the trial will be conducted, that cohort will be split into two. I don't know exactly how many because it'll depend how enrollment goes, but they will be staggered by two weeks. So the, even, even though it's one cohort, there will be two subgroups within that cohort. And that's just to make it more comfortable for everybody in the unit. So there's not so many people, you know, 24 to 30 people, if everybody has a caregiver um, in the unit at one time, it'll allow for people to be more comfortable and the staff to be able to make sure they make everybody as comfortable and, and can do the assessments in as timely a fashion as they can. Is that clear, Jen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it'll be helpful too if people are, you know, in group one or group two, trying not to confuse the groups with cohorts <laughs> or differences in dose. Yes. Well, what we're calling them is cohort 1A and cohort 1B. And those are both then the 25. Right, and then they're both the that, same dose group. And, you know, I, the other thing is this is, you know, I think you've said this a few times, but just worth reiterating, you know, after we get through this, um, these cohorts and this next stage, will there'll be more information that we'll be able to share with the community and be able Absolutely. to kind of give you an update as to if there's another cohort, what will it be and what would be required? As um, soon as we know, we'll be able to share it. But again, it'll, we, we, what we what we have pretty much said publicly is we will say something once we hear back from FDA. Either we'll say we don't need to go higher, which is what I really hope, and we've seen really nice data with the 25 milligram, and that's where we're that's how we're going to move forward. Or it could be that we feel like we need to go to the 50. We that the drug was actually safe and well tolerated. The PK was good, but we need to go to a higher dose. And then we'll be able to tell you exactly what dose that is and the timing of that of, the, of that next cohort. Um, but hopefully it will be in 2023. It won't be any. The FDA, I have to tell you, the FDA has been, in my mind, amazingly responsive. Um, they've met all of their timelines with us. Um, and they have a, agreed to turn the data around relatively quickly, as quickly as they can. Um, so that we can keep the program moving. Um, and, and I think they are very engaged and clearly um, have the utmost respect for Farah and for Jen and for Ron, um, who I think have done a, a, a fabulous job at representing the patient community and advocating for you. So 
um, the agency knows that this is very, very important. Um, and I think here's, here's the, the patient community. Thank you, Carol. Um, one question, so we, we've just got a few more questions left. Um, one of them comes back to um, the open label extension. And when can people expect to hear more about that? Um, and there was also just a, a question around people who participated um, in part one. And I, I think you might've covered it, but probably be worth it to mention again, that people who participated in the phase one study, they're eligible to participate in this phase two study, correct? Yes, yeah, so P anybody who participated in the phase one study is eligible to participate in this phase two study, as well as in the open label extension when, it, when we open it, and anybody who has not participated in, the, um, in any of our trials is also eligible to participate as long as they haven't taken an investigational drug in the last 90 days. Um, so we're, it's open to the entire community, ambulatory and non-ambulatory. Obviously you have to screen and you have to meet certain inclusion and exclusion criteria, which I have not reviewed because I thought it would be much better for you to review that with the site and with Farah than with me. Um, but if you, if you screen and you are eligible, whether you've participated in or not participated in, whether you're ambulatory or non-ambulatory, as long as you're eligible, you can participate in the study. Um, and you asked me, oh, and the open label extension, um, we're as anxious uh, to get that going, probably as you may be more anxious because the sooner we can start collecting the data, the sooner we can get some real clinical outcome data but we really do have to be patient. It's not going to start until clearly at least the FDA has reviewed the 25 milligram dose. And then we'll base that on whether or not we believe it's worthwhile for patients to be taking 25 milligrams. If we don't see increases in protaxin levels, there's no reason to give you a drug that isn't doing anything. Um, and so we'll have to wait and see what happens with the higher dose, if that's the case. But if we do see something with the 25 milligram, it is possible that the open label extension would start with 25, even while the 50 was ongoing. But all of this, I just want to keep driving home, all of this is contingent on the FDA review, reviewing that data and coming to consensus with us as to what the next best steps are. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. And so to summarize, you know, that open label extension really needs to be informed both by safety as well as by dose. You want to make sure that you know the best dose um, to, to do that open label extension study with. And that's in everybody's best interest. Absolutely. Um, one um, question back to kind of some of the logistics of participating and a, a little bit around the burden of that. Um, will there be a stipend or any sort of compensation for participation that might help people like pay for their apartment or expenses or, you know, yeah, things that there, there is, there is, I can't talk to how much or any of that. It has to be fair. And that's all out of my control. Um, but yes, there is a stipend. And they could, um, ask the Clinic Labs team that Absolutely. when they call that, that's the, that's where they can get that information. Yeah, that's where they can get that information. Okay, thank you. Um, and then coming back to um, a little bit about the, the non-human primate study, um, was there any organ damage or abnormal blood panel findings in the animals that died during the, during the talk study? We haven't disclosed that. Um, obviously the animals died, so something went wrong. <laughs> um, so, but we have not disclosed the detail of that. What I think is most important is when we gave you those safety margins where we said it was generally tenfold higher than what we saw in the patients, those were at exposure levels, at blood levels of CTI 1601 that were no adverse event levels. So there was no, or, no histologic findings. So nothing found under a microscope, nothing found in any organ, nothing found clinically, none of the rigidity or anything else. There were at, the only thing that was seen there were, were much milder injection site reactions. So that those numbers, those multiples 
are based on a, a level of CTI 1601 in the blood that is totally clean from a from even from an animal level, from organ level, and there were no findings at all at those doses. And I suppose this is a, sort of a follow-up to that um, related to the human dose thing. Is there a concern that the 100 milligram dose could be toxic? Um, no, it's not that the 100 milligram could be toxic. It's that the 100 milligram, because the concentration of the drug is 50 milligrams in a cc, and I, I'm sorry that I don't have what that translates into a, in a U.S., um, volumetric, but um, the 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 drug is given in a in a, by a needle size that's similar to like insulin. It's a very small needle, um, so, and it's not a, a one cc dose is just not a lot of volume. It's given pretty routinely, but when you start to get up to two cc's, which is what the hundred milligram was, it's actually a pretty sizable amount of volume, even for a human. I mean, it's not a ton, but it's 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 enough to be uncomfortable. Um, and it's probably more likely going to be associated with um, you know, injection site reactions that might be more challenging. And so clearly the low, the minimum effective dose is always the best dose. And because of the volume and the concentration of the drug, I think it's preferred that we go with um, a lower dose if possible. If we can't, because we can't get for taxin levels to where they need to be, it's it's can it's definitely tolerable. Um, obviously, the agency let us go higher. There are drugs that are administered in those volumes, but if we can go with a lower volume and make it more comfortable for everybody to inject, that's what we would like to do. And back to this CC. Um, the for the twenty five milligrams, how many CCs? A half. That's a half a cc, so not even a whole one. Yeah. No. So it, it, it's just better the lower we can go if we can. Um, so Carol, this is back to kind of uh, questions around the what's been disclosed around the non-human primate study. And so someone's asking, um, you know, why why you can't disclose the death of the non-human primates, um, especially to people who you know would be considering participation in clinical trials. So yeah, so uh, as I said, we 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 were not able to identify the death in all three of those animals, the cause of death, I should say, in all three of those animals. We um, and so um, and you will get as a lot more information when you go into the unit and you talk to Dr. Shenudo and ask his questions because you'll have an informed consent that will give you a lot more information as you think about participating in the study. Uh, my hands are tied because this is a public forum and I'm disclosing stuff to the public who could be investing in the company and all, and I'm, so my, I'm, I'm, I'm legally tied to not be, be able to provide anything that's not in the public domain. If you want to screen for the study, you will be able to get a lot more information as part of the informed consent process. And Dr. Shenudo, who knows all the information that we have, will also be able to answer more of your questions. I just can't do it in a public forum. Carol, thanks for mentioning that. That's a really important point that, um, you know, people who are, and obviously there's a lot of interest in the study. We've gotten a lot of really great questions tonight, and we've got yeah. a lot of participation in the webinar. So you know, we appreciate everyone participating this evening, asking questions, you know, being interested and engaged. Um, but this is the, this isn't your only chance to get more information. And um, we would all encourage people who are considering participation in the study to contact the investigator, contact Clinic Labs. Um, we have information on the FARA website under cl active clinical trials. There's there's now information about this study and a contact. Um, it may take them, um, you know, they they don't they might might take them a few hours to get back to you if you call or you email, but somebody will get back to you if you if you contact them. And so there is um, there is much more information out there. 
We'll also um, be sending out information tomorrow, like putting the link to the website and all that kind of stuff um, on on all of Farah's channels. So if if there's information you're looking for, you can't access it, just contact Lane and I and we'll we'll try and connect you to the right person. Um, but you know, Carol, I just want to thank you um, for taking the time tonight to be with us and to share all of the information that uh, Laramar has learned from the preclinical to the phase one, to um, the safety studies, and now, you know, launching into the next phase of development for CTI 1601. So thank you very much. And, and please pass on um, our best wishes to Dr. Ruiz and her family. Thank you very much. And uh, again, to everybody, we really are committed to doing everything we can to move, the, move this forward. Um, and we appreciate all the interest and we appreciate all of your commitment. And we are very, very sensitive um, to the challenges that this trial presents. So, um, and like, like Jen said, I can't, there's things I can't say here in a public forum, but there is a full informed consent process. So you should be able to get as much information as we possibly can provide you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.